Hey everybody, Brian Beeler coming to you from the Storage View Lab alongside Kevin O'Brien. And today we're looking at uh, one of the uh, servers that we've had in our backlog for a little while. We finally got into the review and we're excited to do it. It's the uh, Dell EMC Power Edge R6525 1U Dual Proc AMD server. What uh, stands out to you with this guy? There are a ton of configuration options and actually more than the Dell uh, website currently lets you configure. Yeah, and that's what's a little bit odd with this, and we'll get to some of that, is that when Dell released this second-gen Epic platform, um, it was a transitional process. So the first ones were configured a certain way, and then over time, over the summer really, uh, Dell's been able to enhance the offering a little bit with Gen 4 support, for instance, in the front bays if you get the NVMe option. Uh, but it's been, uh, like I said, transitional. So what you saw earlier in the year is a little bit different than what's available now. And this one kind of sits somewhere in between. But let's talk about that. If we let me start by sliding off the, uh, the bezel. Ours has got the display on it, which is kind of nice. Um, they also have the um, Open Manage mobile compatibility with these for provisioning. It's called QuickSync. Yeah, QuickSync, where you can say it sets up the little Wi-Fi hotspot or what yes. does it even do? Well, it creates a, a very short range uh, Wi-Fi connection that I think you'd also connect into it through uh, mic USB, but it allows you to, instead of having to wheel around a crash cart, you could deploy servers from a mobile phone, a tablet, a notebook, that sort of thing. Yeah, and manageability at scale is important for servers like these, and especially the one you guys that tend to be real dense compute platforms, you're not, it's not like many people are buying one of these. They're normally no, going to be half stack. a rack or whatever, yeah. yeah. So that's uh, that helps from a manageability standpoint. So our guy, we've got uh, 10 SAS drives, wait, we've got eight SAS drives, six SAS drives, and four NVMe drives. Well, we tested six and four, but, or I should say we only tested <laughs> the uh, the four NVMe, but this particular backplane supports uh, four NVMe, uh, NVMe devices and six SAS, or maybe it's 10 SAS, but four bays for NVMe. There's a lot of flexibility. Yeah. And actually, let's take a look at, uh, at some of that. So if we look at the top line configurations of the Dell PowerEdge family, uh, we've highlighted the two that are the AMD platform. So we've got the 6525. The 7525 is the uh, 2U version. Uh, they're both dual proc systems, but can be configured with a single processor if you so choose, I yeah, suppose. I'm not sure who's going to buy one of these to grow into in that way, but uh, it's, it's an option. You can, and of course, those sit alongside the uh, more robust Intel family. As we were talking about, there's a couple different options as you go through the configurator on what you can do with drives. You could slam some three and a half inch hard drives in here if you want. Uh, we do see that from time to time where these are used for analytics and, and somebody wants more capacity in the front of these things. Yeah, and it should be said that uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg when you come uh, when you start working on configuration because... Well, these are quite literally the first two options. <laughs> yeah, you select them and it's like, okay, well, NVMe backplane, but then it rolls into how do you want that configured? Do you want 10 in the front? Do you want two in the rear? I mean, there's a lot of different options for just these types of sizings. Yeah, and it's uh, the flexibility is great, but like you said, there are a number of different options. And when I was playing with the configurator yesterday, it's uh, I, the 10 plus 2, because you can put the two NVMe drives in the back, was kind of buried and you had to come, you know, walk me through the process because there's, yeah. there's so much. Um, one other thing I did want to highlight here is with Gen 4 support, these are the drives that are currently in the configurator. Of course, the pricing is going to change. The reason I highlight this, though, is, is I think is important because when you look down the list of SSDs supported, now this one doesn't say what drives the, these are. If you look at the Gen 3 drives, it's pretty clear which ones are Intel and which ones are Samsung. Yeah. These could be, uh, well, they could be anything, Intel, Samsung, Kyoxia, or SK Hynix. Um, but the pricing is what is what's really interesting because I think a lot of people think Gen 4 SSDs and they think it's expensive. What we're highlighting there is that for similar, those prices that, that we showed are very similar to what the Gen 3 prices are. And in some cases, the Gen 4 drives are less expensive. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing that already where the, um, the newest offerings in capacity, density is all going on Gen 4 only which you could say a lot of the Gen 4 drives are backwards compatible, or it's just almost all of them are backwards right. compatible. 
why not just go with that for the latest and greatest? And we're seeing certain vendors just start putting their newest offerings on Gen 4 only. Right. So the street prices might be a little different if you're configuring your own server, but in the Dell configurator, just be really sure that if you're looking at something like this, especially that supports Gen 4, that performance delta is massive. So there's, Yeah, your read bandwidth differences, I mean, it's going to be double. Right. So. so there's absolutely no reason to, to not spend the little bit more, or in some cases, a little bit less for the Gen 4 drives. So as we take a look at um, the other configuration options. Yeah, one... this guy is where it gets fun because if you're looking, <laughs> when we're first looking at this, you look at the back and there's a number of little slots and you can get, you can get quickly mixed up on which ones are the OCP slots, which, uh, which are the uh, PCIe slots, and then how they're consumed uh, based on what the uh, drive configuration is. Okay, so real quick before we get to the back risers and we'll do that, Let's walk through the rest of this front to back. Yes, yeah, so this, this is, is an interesting mounting decision. Yeah, and we'll see this theme throughout this particular server where there's a lot of uh, unique aspects to how Dell configured this. For one, the RAID card sits up front in this server, right. uh, and it basically has uh, quick and easy access to the um, SATA and SAS base, and it just gets it out of the way from a lot of the things that go in the back. Well, right. There's not much wasted space here, and that's actually one of the compromises, right? Because you really would have liked to have seen an M.2 boot drive on board, and I know we'll get to it in the risers, but there's not a ton of room here. There's a little gap in the back. There's a little gap over here, but it's dense, right? Yeah, and one one advantage with uh, there's you, in a lot of these servers, there's usually a big dead space right between uh, in the area between the uh, backplane and the uh, right. fans. And what, one of the advantages with putting all the RAID card stuff up there is uh, usually you have, this is gonna be your coolest area, uh, area in the server, but it's not just uh, the benefit to the RAID card itself, but by moving it into the front and ha instead of having the back, there's more space for air to flow through as it moves in the back of the server. So you end up having increased performance on the cooling capabilities where it might've been cramped uh, from trying to fit that somewhere back here. So speaking of cooling, we've got eight fans even though it looks like just four these are double fan modules so those run across the front obviously pop out really easy easy and they're nice and out. quiet i mean we've seen some servers that get sketchy on their uh, cooling profiles sure dell does a fantastic job where if the server's not using a lot of uh, load it keeps things nice and quiet and then if it, even it starts ramping up it's not a ear bleeding type scream from the fans that's good i don't like my ears to bleed <laughs> Uh, unless I want them to. Uh, two AMD processors here. We've got 16 of the 32 DIMM slots populated. You've got, what, 512 in here total? Yes. Okay. And on as we move to the back, we've got power supplies on the edges. But let's pop some of these risers and take a look at that because yeah, back, so to this this, is... back to this slide we're looking at, these are a vast array of configuration options, which is a little overwhelming in the documentation because I think it's... Um, it, it's the difference between uh, half height, half length bays versus full size bays versus OCP bays. It gets a little bit confusing in the configurator. Yeah, and it really comes down to how you want to leverage the platform because maybe you need some full height bays or you need half height or your interest is more towards half height but an increased number. So, and then some of it comes down to do you want to fit more drives versus edge cards? So there's a lot of different options here. Right, so this riser you popped out has got the boss card in it one of the bays, right? Yeah, and the boss card consumes one of the bays, so even though it's not really mentioned in the configurator, it's more of like you want a boot drive, but it doesn't, it, there's there's always compromises on how you want to leverage a platform. Obviously, Especially the one used that are really dense, right? Because that's why Kevin was kind of grumpy about not having an M.2 on board, because if you go with the boss card, which can give you uh, two M.2 drives, either in RAID 0 or RAID 1. Or JBOD or RAID 1. JBOD or RAID 1? Yeah, so you get an option where you can either access each drive individually, individually okay. or in a uh, RAIDed protected form. Right, so that'll give you your boot area, but you sacrifice a PCIe slot, and one of our other slots has a fiber channel card in it, so that's an issue, because we're just down to one now. And if we wanted to put, what, a T4 or something in there, that's great. But our connectivity is somewhat limited. Now, they do mitigate that a little bit by uh, the OCP slot here in the back. Let me slide this guy out. 
And so this is, what is this, the Broadcom card? But there are yeah. many others. Yeah, you can, there's options from uh, two port of uh, 10 gig, quad port uh, one gig, and I think I even saw a quad port 25 gig option. Yeah, so they go up to 25 gig in the, in the uh, OCP slot. I think the point is, is that it's about planning and making sure that you're putting the right resources in the right spot. So you can use the OCP slot, get 25 gig if you like that particular card or option or whatever is available. Um, it is interesting though, where when the AMD servers first come, uh, came onto the market, they were looked at as more of the value offering, and now it's more of a restructuring where this really does seem to be more of the top tier performance model. Well, the, clearly from a, not just the core count, but the processing power that we've seen, not just from Dell, but from the other systems that have come in that we've reviewed with AMD inside, especially Gen 2 Epic, they've yeah. been really strong. Yeah. Um, so on the riser side, though, just to finish that thought, anything else there that's that's worth considering? Not really. I mean, it really comes down to make sure you plan well because I I don't know if you could really uh, restructure this after you deploy a build. Okay. All right. So then let's take a look at performance. Just as a quick reminder, I already jumbled up the bay count in the beginning, but you tested for these charts for. NVMe Micron 9300 SSDs. Yeah, all of our tests focused around NVMe performance because when you're looking at the processors and RAM configuration that you have, I mean, no one's going to be putting that on hard drives or even SAS really these days. The okay. focus is going to be on NVMe. Okay, but before you get into that, I just went into the whole thing about how important Gen 4 SSDs are. Yeah. And we didn't so, test with Gen 4 SSDs, which I know we have because I see a pile of Hynix and uh, other drives in the lab. Yeah, so there's uh, there's an interesting nuance with the server where early production builds apparently had a cable for Gen 3 support that can get swapped out for Gen 4 support. And I believe it's this guy right here. And we have been trying to figure out why our drives only uh, negotiate at... Um, Three yeah, or at the PCI Gen 3 speeds versus Gen 4, and I, and everyone keeps on coming back to it's probably an early rev cable. All right, so we might have an early rev, but it's important that it's fixable, probably, yeah. with a new cable, and that's actually somewhat unique. So as I was saying at the beginning, as Dell rolled this out uh, through this year, that there was a migration somewhere along the way where uh, the Gen 4 support came along natively when you select that NVMe backplane. Uh, in a lot of the other servers that we've seen from other brands that don't offer Gen 4 support in those front bays, there's no path to get there. And even if there was, I mean, if you look at some of the platforms that we've seen with uh, like 24 bays of NVMe, you open it up and there's probably, I think each bay has two thin wires that go to it that's kind of routed around the uh, chassis. You'd probably be spending the good part of a day to upgrade that versus this guy, which one cable and uh, take out a little brace for a fan or actually top, pop out this guy that just swings up. Right. And you could swap it out in maybe a minute or so. Sure, sure. Easy stuff. So just as a point of clarity, that's why we don't have Gen 4 drive data, although we hope to resolve that uh, in the near future. We didn't want to hold up the review, though, in getting this out because even with the older SSDs, it's still a uh, highly competent platform. So I'll let you get back to the uh, the charts now. So the big thing to take away with the uh, performance, it is fantastic. And to get an idea of how well these numbers are, the only thing that we've tested that's higher than uh, our 16 VM count uh, of uh, suspension this test is a um, quad CPU platform that we had, uh, that we had in that uh, was either 4 or 5U and it was expandable to 8 CPU. You might know what it is. It was the SR950 uh, from Lenovo, but it was a very a very stout Intel platform. That's many more used than this. And that thing only got 500 more transactions per second in the uh, 16 VM uh, score. So this thing is an absolute powerhouse. And uh, obviously all the other dual proc AMD platforms are uh, going to be the same type of uh, deal. And it really just goes to show you that these things are no longer the value offerings that everyone is trying to position them as when well, they hit the market. Definitely don't have to be, right? Now with the the CPUs are absolute beasts when it comes clearly here to transactional performance. Yeah. And then we go to our uh, SQL Server performance. <laughs> yeah, this is one where it just it topped out the test. Our test tops out at one millisecond for a benchmark factory, and this guy at a 4VM and 8VM uh, load, one millisecond. And it was... Um, one VM per a uh, drive, 
uh, for four VMs and then two VMs per drive for eight VMs. So evenly balanced across our, again, Gen 3 drives, but there's, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with this. So when we get down to our uh, sequential bandwidth test, this is an area where we would have higher numbers if we were testing Gen 4 drives. Right. So with uh, sequential re, we topped out at uh, it was like 12 gig a second. Although you could get higher numbers than this with more drives of Gen 3. So if you had a, um, a 10 drive or 12 drive configuration, you might not notice that much of a difference. But for the smaller drive counts where you're probably going to try and find a balance between NVMe for, uh, for performance workloads, maybe some uh, drives for uh, logs or something like that, you might not have NVMe for everything. And that's where concentrating that workload and having high performance comes in. So if you had Gen 4 drives, you'd probably be looking at double the bandwidth there. So okay. instead of like 12, 13 gigs a second, you'd be sitting uh, probably north of 20 gigs a second. Okay. And then the uh, small block uh, throughput. Again, this is another area where um, we have some Gen 4 drives in right now. They're good for um, like 1 million IOPS uh, each. This guy with uh, our four Micron 9300 drives got a little bit over 2.5 million IOPS read and uh, just under uh, maybe 800,000 IOPS write. But a loss comes down to the drives that you pick. And if you go Gen 4, you're going to be getting higher numbers across the board. Okay. So when we think about the capabilities of this platform, clearly uh, CPUs are great. 512 memory helps to drive this thing. It supports up to, I think, four terabyte in the LR DIMMs and two in the uh, uh, in the regular. I mean, can you imagine filling this thing that, with that much memory? The would two, it weigh any more though? Because it, it would weigh, you know, a little bit more, and then uh, and then pile it full of, of Gen four SSDs and and in one U, from a pure comp computational standpoint, for all those high end AI workloads, that analytics, that sort of thing, this thing you're would gonna, just cr crunch. You're gonna be hard pressed to find a more higher performing platform that's not another dual proc AMD server. Right, and, and that's the great thing. And the question is then, is Dell the best choice uh, for that category? And you will pay a little more for a Dell server, there's no doubt about that, but you get so much out of it. You get iDRAC, lifecycle controller, you get the bezels with Wi-Fi if you want it. You get all these other management and... Uh, uh, and you know, even serviceability, you look at how a lot of the um, maybe tier two servers are laid out or the traditional white box platform. Yes, you're going to be able to benefit on cost savings early on, but through the product life cycle, you have to worry about how are you going to restructure your driver and firmware layer across everything installed. Dell, you can do that with one utility and it does everything for you if it's a Dell product. Right, and it's one of the best out there across all server platforms. So it's yeah, not actually just I'm going through that process right now on some of our R740s and it takes me maybe 20, 30 minutes a server and it's updating everything. Right. So great platform, uh, especially now the, the modern one that's shipping today with the Gen 4 support on it. If you're looking at that, like I said, make sure that you're pricing those Gen 4 SSDs. It's totally worth it. Uh, and, and in fact, in some cases, like I noted, is less expensive than the Gen 3 SSDs. So definitely make those at least a couple part of the configuration if you really want to drive uh, the best performance you can out of this box. Overall, we're big fans and uh, we think you will be too if you go with uh, uh, an AMD platform. This is a great one to be. Thanks for tuning in.